Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the um, IADBM for inviting me to speak. Um, and especially thank Dr. Felix Leal and Dr. Blanche Kruby for, uh, and also Don for putting everything together. Um, great to be in Nashville. It's a gorgeous day. We're going to change the uh, information just a little bit. And if you have questions, let me know. I'm going to basically talk about a new idea, and that is pneumopedics. So we've heard about the word orthodontics, which is moving teeth, and orthopedics, which is remodeling bone. And now we're moving it forward into pneumopedics. And pneumopedics is non-surgical upper airway remodeling. So gonna, that's a theme. And look at the science behind it. Let's understand the concepts. And we'll illustrate that with a little bit of uh, clinical information as we get towards the end. My conflict of interest dis uh, disclosure, um, I'm based in Oregon, Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, we have a company called Biomodeling Solutions. And um, our company is registered with the FDA. All the, all the devices that we use are registered with the FDA. We are FDA approved for mild to moderate um, sleep apnea. And we have uh, several US, Canadian, European, European and international patents. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. everything must be based on a simple idea. And once you've find discovered it, it's so compelling, beautiful, we'll say to each other, um, how could it have been any different? So when we get that aha moment, realize, okay, now I really get it. And so it's usually a principle which is fairly simple, and we take it forward from there. Once you've discovered that idea, you've got to deal with two things, healthy skepticism and cynicism. Two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. So, by the end of this morning, or end of this session, tell me which of these statements you prefer. Okay. So what we're going to do uh, this morning is um, look at the objectives here. This is Dr. Gimeno, one of the original uh, people in sleep apnea. And what he said is there's a marked interaction between the upper airway and craniofacial morphology. And so if we can manipulate, change, modify, improve the craniofacial architecture, there's a chance that we're going to be working with the upper airway and airway issues such as sleep apnea. So the idea this morning is to introduce the idea of pneumopedics and understand the idea of craniofacial epigenetics Epigenetics is a huge booming field, which you've probably heard about, and we're going to apply that specifically to the craniofacial and dental region. And the craniofacial epigenetics includes epigenetic orthopedics, which is talking about bone remodeling and bone formation. We'll talk about it in a bit of detail. And we'll talk about epigenetic orthodontics, moving teeth without applying any force, without using any braces, those teeth are gonna move. And what we're going to be doing here is understanding how to do that clinically, and we're going to use oral appliances. And if you do the review, there's at least 148 oral appliances out there, maybe more than that by now. But what we're going to look at is a biomimetic oral appliance, biomimicry, biomimetics, biological dentistry. This is the theme, and we take that theme and take it to the next level. What are you going to do? What's your take on message today is to apply those concepts to the clinical management of your patients who have been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, and you're going to work in a team. You're not going to work in isolation. It's a multidisciplinary team. It's the medical model in the dental office, and biological dentists are highly poised to be successful in that way. So we're going to be looking at uh, bony changes, soft tissue changes, and we're going to be looking at airway changes. And uh, we'll go through some of these ideas uh, as we go along. What are we trying to achieve? When our patient walks through the door, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve enhanced craniofacial homeostasis. We'll talk a little bit more about that. How are we going to achieve that? That's our ideal. How are we going to achieve it is through developmental mechanisms. And specifically, sutural homeostasis and pneumatization. And I actually ate a dictionary for breakfast this morning, so a lot of words will come out. That was a joke. 
so developmental mechanisms, they are encoded by genes. They're encoded by genes. The genes that you inherited, the genes you were born with, the genes you keep for life, you have those developmental mechanisms as you're sitting here in this room. The question is, how do you work with them? How do you activate them? How do you implement them? Two mechanisms we're going to talk about, sutural homeostasis and pneumatization. The sutures. Look at the human body from head down to toe. Where do you find sutures? You find them in the craniofacial region. It's not an accident. They're there for a reason. So our question now is, why do we have sutures and can we harness them clinically? Sutures, like any other structure of the body, are subject to homeostasis. They want to be in balance, equilibrium, and harmony. And if they're not, something will happen to try to reach that balance. The other thing is pneumatization. Humans, modern humans, we have a huge brains. We have really big brains, apparently. <laughs> so what's the idea? You know the, the Big Bang Theory? There's two Big Bang Theories. One is on the idea of how the, the uh, universe was created. The second one happens in evolution. Modern humans, as Homo sapiens sapiens, we got big brains real fast. In terms of evolutionary history, it's suddenly we got these big brains. Now, if you've got a huge big brain, it means you've got a very heavy head. And so to lighten this head, okay, we're going to pneumatize. We're going to take the bone, and we're going to on the in internal surface, remodel it, fill it with air, make it light. And that is also the cranial cavity which carries the brain. So what we're going to be doing is we want to achieve uh, homeostasis through these mechanisms. It's a biomimetic correction. We're going to mimic the body. And plus or minus, by doing that, you'll get a functional correction. And when I say functional correction, it's physiologic function. Breathing through the nose. The lips are gently in contact when you're at rest. The teeth are slightly not in contact when you're at rest. When you wake up in the morning, your tongue is sitting on your palate. It means your airway was open all night long and you weren't snoring. That is what I mean by functional correction. The way we're going to achieve that is through craniofacial epigenetics. You have the genetic potential to heal yourself. You were born with that potential. So if you were to cut your hand accidentally, the body will do whatever it has to do to heal that wound for you automatically, auto-regulation and auto-correction, okay? The craniofacial region is no different. We have to have the conditions, the environment for the body to heal, and if you do that, you're going to harness your genetic potential. And people use the word genetic potential without really thinking, hold on, what am I talking about? What does it mean? What is genetic potential? Here's my definition. Genetic potential is producing the optimal outcome in the prevailing conditions subject to a viable population of stem cells. Let's go back one century, stem cell technology was not available. Now we have an idea of what stem cells are and what they can do for us. And if we can target that population, they will do the work for us. A viable population of stem cells. You have to have stem cells, you have to be able to target them. Are there any stem cells in the craniofacial region? Yes, huge amounts. And what's my first area to look for stem cells? Where are you going to go? Did someone say the periodontal ligament? Packed full of stem cells. We call it a ligament. It's a historical name. It's actually a misnomer. We've been misdirected inadvertently. It's not a ligament. It's a modified suture. The job of a suture is to make bone. Throughout your entire life, teeth are going to erupt, super erupt, and as they do so, they're going to be producing bone behind them based on a viable population of stem cells. Now we're going to extract a tooth. If you extract the tooth, what have you done? You've just removed that stem cell population. You can't generate, regenerate new bone because the stem cell population has been depleted. And I'll tell you a secret, underneath my turban, I'm slightly bald. The reason for that, uh, I, have, I have some people who are agreeing with me. So the reason is that the stem cell population is starting to get depleted, and you can't make new hair in that region. But look at my fingernails. They're going to grow forever, and as long as I live, 
because I have a population of stem cells in the nail bed. Okay? So we look at tooth extraction. You extracted the physical tooth, but you extracted the genetic potential at the same time. And that is probably not a biomimetic procedure. So let's define craniofacial genetics. I'm going to use a person's natural genes, okay, to correct, straighten the jaws, teeth, soft tissues, and functional spaces painlessly using biomimetic appliances, okay? So um, this is your natural genes. This is not GM. There's no genetic modification. This is your own naturally occurring genes. We're going to correct the hard tissues, which is bone, the soft tissues, mostly muscle, for example, the tongue, dental tissue, the teeth, and the functional spaces, which is predominantly the upper airway. It could be the TMJ space also. Interesting thing is we're going to do this painlessly. It's a pain-free procedure. If you have pain, there is inflammation. If you have pain, you move from physiology into pathology. The body has a way of growing, developing naturally, and growing without any pain. So it has to be a pain-free procedure using this uh, technique. So let's a bit more detail. What do you mean by craniofacial homeostasis? The human body is in a state of homeostasis, or wants to be in a state of homeostasis. The same with our blood pressure, body temperature are under physiologic control. Okay, your blood sugar level is under physiologic control. Similarly, the craniofacial region is in the spatial and functional regulation. I know where I am in space. I know that I'm standing up. I've got receptors. I've got proprioception tells me I am standing up. Your proprioceptor is saying in your knees, for example, that you're sitting down. So what's the difference? That spatial change means there's going to be a functional change. What that means is my blood pressure is a little bit higher, not because I'm nervous, because I'm standing up. And your blood pressure is a bit lower because you are sitting down. Spatial and functional regulation. The craniofacial region, the teeth, the soft tissues, the bone, the functional spaces, know where they are, and we can work with them. The interesting thing is that the craniofacial region is subject to developmental compensation, and that's a key point. Developmental compensation, and actually it's from the top down, it's descending developmental compensation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, but that's a key word, the compensation. of What are you going to do if you're not in balance? You're going to compensate. And if you're chronically not in balance, you're going to chronically compensate. But when you keep on doing that, there's a price to pay for that. And the other thing is, when you're young, you compensate extremely well. And as you get older, the ability to compensate decreases. There's wear, tear, damage, aging, senescence, and finally death. So we want to have the degree of compensation to be minimized. And there's two types of compensation. Developmental, which is the top down, that's craniofacial. And then bottom up, ascending from the feet, that's postural compensation. And there's going to be a place in the body where they're going to meet. And classically, it's C1, the first cervical vertebrae, which means that the head posture is going to change. That's your point, your pivot. We can easily see how much compensation that patient is making. Now, the amount of compensation varies from patient to patient. We'll take 10 kids and say, run 100 yards. One guy finishes first. Everyone else finishes later. That's what your patients are like. There's a range of abilities. There's a range of abilities. There's a degree of compensation. It varies from patient to patient. And that's your clinical judgment in terms of what I need to do to make my patient better, to make them well. Trick question, which body is in homeostasis? You got it. They're both in homeostasis. But this guy is working harder to stay in balance. Okay, that's an example of compensation. Working, the body has to work hard, do additional work, spend additional energy, use up additional tissues to remain in balance, equilibrium, homeostasis. Now, I'll use an analogy. That pivot point that you see there, that is your occlusion. So, I can't change the way that my feet are going to touch the ground. Both my feet have to touch the ground because of gravity, but I can change the occlusion. And by changing the occlusion a little bit, a little bit here, there'll be a big change in the rest of the body. The occlusion is the end point of the body with respect to the plantar surfaces of the feet. 
a feet or an endpoint of the body, and then the other boundary is your occlusion. Now, why is that? Because when you start life, you start as a flat embryonic disc, and the disc undergoes curvature, so the top end ends up inside the mouth. Enamel, as you know, is formed from surface ectoderm. Technically, teeth are on the outside of the body. And so I can't change my feet, but between those two boundaries, all the functional spaces for physiologic function have to be accommodated. All the spaces have to be accommodated. These are functional spaces. For example, two nerve endings. The synapse or the synapse, there's a small space there. And if those two boundaries are cramped, all of those spaces are going to be slightly cramped. There's going to be a lot of compensation. The intervertebral disc will be slightly compressed. Blood pressure will be slightly higher, so on and so forth. Digestion won't be so efficient. So we optimize the functional spaces. We optimize the health of the individual. The human body is a system of functional spaces. And this is the compensation that happens if they're not uh, optimal. So decompensation is required for function. So homeostasis, because of complexity during compensation, because of complexity, patients present with a range of clinical signs and symptoms. It's the underlying etiology is similar in most cases most of the time, but the way the patients present is quite different. It's like throwing dice. There's a finite number of outcomes. You can't predict which one you'll get un unless the dice are loaded. So th exactly the point. So what happens is your patient walks through the door, their chief complaint is that my teeth are not straight. Or they're saying, I've got TMJ pain. Or I'm snoring at night. Or I've got tooth bruxism. Or I've got facial asymmetry. Or I've got morning headaches and so on and so forth. These are how patients present, even though the underlying etiology is similar in most cases most of the time. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to enhance the overall health of the craniofacial region. You have to go above and beyond teeth, and as a biological dentist, you're already well aware of that concept of connecting the entire human body, which includes 32 teeth. And by doing that, we're going to uh, provide treatment protocols that address the underlying etiology of the signs and symptoms that the patient presents with. The, the question is not how am I going to relieve that headache. The question is why does that patient have a headache? The question is not how am I going to straighten those teeth. The question is why are those teeth not straight? So on and so forth. Let's look at the underlying etiology, unravel it, and then we'll go for a correction. So we use the natural genes to correct and straighten the craniofacial structures using biomimetic appliances. Epigenetics, people are aware of it, it's in the news, you're probably far more aware of it than a typical group that I talk to. But what we're looking at here is we're studying phenotypic changes which occur without changing the DNA. How unusual. So uh, if Darwin was here, I'm not sure if he would agree. Okay? But here what we're saying is we can change the phenotype, the outcome, without changing the underlying genes. Okay, and the changes are mediated via chemical groups which surround the DNA, associated protein systems, and chromatin. So regard the DNA as you know your candy, and you have a wrapper that's going around it, and that wrapper is reactive, responsive to environmental signals. And those signals could be biochemical, they could be chemical, they could be any type of signal. They could be physical, they could be mechanical signals. Okay. And the types of epigenetic modification that can occur are things like rabalization, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, sumylation, and ubiquination. And the test is to say that after two beers tonight. <laughs> Craniofish of genetics, okay. Using a person's natural genes to correct, straighten the jaws, teeth, soft tissue function spaces painlessly using biomimetic appliances. What do you mean by biomimetics? What is biomimicry? Okay. It's a science. It's quantifiable. It's measurable. It's repeatable. Okay. You can subject it to statistical analysis. It's a science. It studies natural models. Uses designs and processes to solve human problems. 
what is the natural model for the modern human? The model is to be symmetrical on the outside and relatively asymmetric on the inside. The natural model for humans is two eyes, 10 fingers, 32 teeth. We are going to mimic, replicate that model as far as we can. Symmetry and all of those components, okay? And these are the designs and the processes that we're going to use to try to get there, these are developmental processes, developmental mechanisms. Developmental mechanisms are encoded by genes and you keep your genes for life. So if you can target those genes, if you can activate specific pathways, there's a chance that you will enhance the quality and longevity of that particular patient. Biomimetics, this woodpecker is very efficient at removing wood. And so the axe has been redesigned following a natural template. We already have a natural template. It's encoded by our genes. We inherit a blueprint which will say, I will make you one perfect human. I'll give you all the systems that you need to have a efficiently moving, breathing, growing, developing human. That's the blueprint that you have. That's your genetic potential. Whether you achieve that or not, it's an interaction between the genetics and the environment and that's your epigenetic response. And uh, what we're going to be doing, you could regard it as biomedical orthodontics, but here's the thing, it's cosmetic treatment, but it's got health benefits. You look better, you function better, you sleep better, you're a healthier and happier individual. So what makes craniofacial epigenetics different from traditional dental alveolar orthodontics? What's the difference, or is it the same thing? Well, number one is craniofacial epigenetics is aimed at the overall health of the craniofacial region. And we provide treatment protocols that address the underlying etiology of the signs and symptoms of the condition. So overall health of the craniofacial region, I'm talking brain health, I'm talking TMJ health, I'm talking airway health, I'm talking anti-aging of the face. It's no coincidence that children who are not sleeping well have an increased risk of developing uh, ADHD. It's not a coincidence that patients who get older develop dementia and they've got other chronic illnesses going on at the same time. Craniofacial health includes the brain. We know that athletes who have insufficient craniofacial development are more prone to concussions. That's brain health. So you can impact your patient's life, quality of life, by addressing craniofacial health indirectly through your channel to the, f to the body, which is the craniofacial and oral uh, structures. The way we're going to do this, the way we're going to uh, address the craniofacial region is through pneumopedics. We're going to non-surgically remodel the upper airway. We're going to include epigenetic orthopedics, bone formation. You're going to make brand new bone. You're going to increase the bone volume for your adult patients without using surgery, drugs, no injections, and it's pain-free. If you have a viable population of stem cells, you can grow bone. Let's say you go skiing and you break a leg. What does the body do? It heals. You go skiing again, you break the same leg, the body does the same thing, it heals. You go skiing for the third time, you have no medical insurance. <laughs> you, you break your leg, what happens? the body heals it again. What does that tell you? What you inherit is a way of making bone, not how much bone you will make. If you break a jaw, it will heal as long as you have stem cells there, okay? So when you talk about epidemic orthopedics, it's bone formation, brand new bone, increased bone volume, and then the bone gets remodeled to make it into the bone uh, shape that you've inherited as your blueprint. And of course, we've got epigenetic orthodontics, which is the ability to move teeth. The teeth and bone, these are not two separate structures. They talk to each other. That interface is a suture, which historically we call a ligament. Let's go back and look at the structure of a ligament. Look at the structure of the suture. The formation, the development, the structure, and the behavior are completely different. And what we have inside our mouths are 32 sutures which are available to make bone for you. 
Here's uh, one of our older heroes, Dr. Marvin Moss, uh, Columbia University in New York. He passed away, and uh, I went to his uh, retirement uh, um, symposium in 2003, the first time I met him. Okay, We'd been in touch, I'm originally from England, and I'd been in touch with Dr. Moss for a long time, but actually the first time I actually met the guy, great guy. And what he said is that the facial skeleton is formed by ossification within genic membranes. So let's go back one generation, and the words are a bit different because the technology wasn't there to precisely define what we're working with. He talks about genic membranes, the membrane that surrounds the bone and surrounds the cartilage, the osteogenic periosteum, the bone-forming membrane. Well, guess what's inside that membrane? Did someone say stem cells? Okay. There we have adult stem cells. That's the ability to make brand new bone. Okay. Now, the facial skeleton is formed is largely secondary and adaptive to surrounding soft tissues and functional spaces. Now I'm going to be a little bit nervous because we're all dentists. Okay? What about the teeth? If uh, the maxilla and the mandible are subject to soft tissues and functional spaces, teeth haven't got a chance. They've got no chance. They're going to be crowded. They're going to be impacted. They may not erupt. It doesn't make sense biologically to have a system set up with teeth without taking dental tissue into account. So when I said, Dr. Moss, what about teeth? Where did it fit into the equation? And long story, real short, in my humble opinion, the functional matrix wasn't finished. It took us halfway. It wasn't quite finished. So what I did was take that as a starting point and develop the spatial matrix hypothesis, published in 2004, University of Michigan, 2007, 2009. And the idea is the spatial matrix. What is a spatial matrix? It's a place, it's a site, it's a locus where developmental events occur as gene environmental interactions proceed. So development is going to go on regardless because genes are going to be expressed according to temporal spatial patterning. So all the genes have like a time switch, a biological clock, at a certain time certain genes are expressed. So development is going to go on anyway but as the development is happening, there's an interaction with the environment. And the interaction is optimal, you get a great outcome. And if it's not, you get compensation, and it's not so good. An example is the developmental dynamics of the oral facial complex. What is the developmental mechanism? What is the development event that's occurring here? Tooth eruption. It's development. Teeth are erupting. And maybe the third molar might not have sufficient space because the environment interaction with that system said, I can't get 32 teeth into this small space. But you have the potential to do so. So look at the functional matrix. What Dr. Uh, Moss said is that the tooth has been extracted here. You lost the function, and therefore you lost the tissue that goes with it. There's been a loss of alveolar bone, which is completely correct. But if you look very carefully, there's some other stuff going on. Look at the size of the sinus here compared to this size. And what you can see is on this side here, the third molars are still intact. Okay? And on this side, the third molars have been removed. So yes, the bone did resorb. The bone was lost. But there was a second change that wasn't reported. And the second change is pneumatization. Pneumatization, we've known historically, we've never been able to capture the phenomenon clinically to say we can do something with it. Pneumatization becomes pneumopedics. I'm going to remodel the airway. The sinus is a part of the upper airway. What that slide tells us is when we work with the tooth and we remodel the bone, there's a knock-on effect on the upper airway. There's, that's the way the system is set up. Okay? We know the role of the pneumocytes in the maxillary sinus. One of the roles of the pneumocytes is to produce nitric oxide. And we know that nitric oxide is a small vessel dilator. So what we know, or what we think now, is when you inspire air through nasal breathing, you pick up the nitric oxide from that sinus and deliver it to your pulmonary alveoli, you get good oxygen exchange. So when that tooth is extracted here, the body is going to compensate. Here's a pneumatization occurring. Okay, so we can talk to the airway by working with teeth. Long story real short. 
So according to the functional matrix, what Dr. Moss said is during growth, the spatial functional alignments of the skeletal elements are maintained through remodeling of bony surfaces. So let's do an experiment. Just put your fingers right there, okay? Right about there. And uh, somebody uh, can tell me what bone is that? That's your maxilla. That's your maxilla, okay? It's a huge big bone. The mid face, the middle of the face is maxilla. So it's going to remodel on its bony surfaces. And right down here, there's a bony surface. That's where your teeth start. So if you're remodeling the maxilla, the teeth are going to be moving at the same time. So the functional matrix was good, but not quite complete because the key element, which is the teeth, the dental tissues, were, was not included in that old hypothesis. So the craniofacial region is unique throughout the body. It has hard tissue, which is bone, soft tissues, for example, muscle. It has functional spaces, such as the airway, but the number four tissue is dental tissue. That's craniofacial. No other part of the body has the dental tissues, and we have to include them in the, in the hypothesis to get a complete explanation. So spatial matrix takes teeth into account. According to the old functional matrix idea, ossification centers arise during growth. These are the historic words. We call them ossification centers because technologically, we didn't quite know or understand what was going on. And the question is, how do they arise? These are unanswered questions from the previous ideas. Bones are displaced by soft tissue and expanding functional spaces. Why and how are they being displaced? We need to answer these questions. And then the bones are going to meet at sutures as they grow by deposition at their, at their boundaries. How do they know when to start? What's the control mechanism? So these were unanswered questions from the functional matrix hypothesis. So we take that idea and take it a step further. Spatial matrix, how do they arise? We now know that the ossification centers are um, sites of signal transduction due to temporal spatial patterning. At a certain place, at a certain time, a specific gene is turned on and said, time to make bone. That's an ossification center. So fertilization, and now you have an embryo. The embryo is completely soft tissue, and at some point a gene is switched on saying, time to make bone, and now the embryo is a fetus, and the fetus becomes a child. So we have genes at a certain time, at a specific place, a gene is switched on, and you get differentiation, temporal spatial patterning. That's how you know where to make bone. Why is the bone displaced? Well, there's increased neurofunctional demand. Modern humans have got huge brains, and that huge brain needs to be fed, and needs to be fed through oxygen, now you need a big airway. Humans have the ability to speak, and what we have here is increased functional space for the larynx, and what we did with our craniofacial architecture is change it, so then we've got enough space for speaking. That's called clinorynchy. Clinorynchy, the cranial adaptations for speech, and so, yeah, the bones are going to be displaced by this huge big brain that's developing, and we need to increase functional space, specifically the upper airway. And if our jaws are retruded, they're going to impinge on the airway, and it's going to give you less, a less efficient system. The bone keeps growing. How do they know when to stop? So right now, the brain is growing. Here's my suture. The brain's growing, and it's been, the suture's been spread apart, being stretched. And so the bone is going to grow back, but why doesn't it overgrow? Why does it actually stop growing? Well, what you have there is a biological boundary. You have a functional space. The same way two nerves are separated by a small space, the sutures are separated by a small space. And that space has been measured. And the, the distance is between 100 to 400 micrometers. On average, 250 micrometers, which is a quarter of a millimeter. And when you turn that powerful expansion screw, how much do you turn it? 0.25 millimeters. By trial and error, the dental profession realized that 0.25 seems to work. It's in the biological boundary. If that suture is compressed, 
So it's less than 250 microns. It will resolve bone to get back to about 250. If you stretch the suture, it'll make new bone to get you back to about 250. Okay, very gentle stretch. And so sutural homeostasis is encoded by genes, and you have those genes for life. Spatial matrix, let's talk about the idea. Let's go from the front to the, to the well, I'm going to give the clinical idea first. Spatial matrix, you see, according to Dr. Moss, you see that tooth been extracted and the bone was resolved. But what happened here? I didn't touch that tooth. It suddenly has changed. Look at the, the occlusal plane here. Look at that tooth there. So what we have is sutural homeostasis. The suture here is no longer in balance. There's a big space on top of it. And that space is the spatial matrix, and the tooth will go into the space until the suture is back into equilibrium. When this enamel is just touching that mucosa lightly, it will stop erupting. It won't erupt through into the bone. It will stop erupting right there. There's a mechanical signal saying, I'm in contact, I'm in a place of balance, equilibrium homeostasis, that's a spatial matrix. And the suture here is also in balance. Now, whilst that was occurring, listen to the example here. Here, you've got a missing premolar. You've got a retained deciduous molar. So what's happened is the upper premolar has super erupted into the space. So there's a spatial change, okay, and there's a response. And what happens? You start getting pneumatization. So as your second and third molars start to erupt, we know that the sinus will remodel into that area, pneumatization. So let's look at bone formation. Here's an ossification center which arises during development de novo for the first time. So at one point, all of these gray cells, all of them are stem cells. And the stem cell at B said, enough of this, I'm going to form bone. And that's an ossification center. So what it is here is a site of signal transduction due to temporal spatial patterning. And you can see the adult stem cells here on A. Now I've got two pieces of bone formed by intramembrous ossification. What do we call that biologically? Biologically, that's a suture. The definition of a suture is a joint between two bones formed by intramembrous ossification. Okay? Let's do a crazy experiment and do this, and that's a tooth. What do you call it now? That's a periodontal suture. It's got the development, the structure, and the behavior of a suture, okay? It's subject to sutural homeostasis. Spatial matrix, let's go through it from the top down. So during growth, the spatial and functional alignment of the maxillary mandible is maintained through remodeling bony surfaces, including the periodontium to prevent function. So the little bit in blue is from the functional matrix, Dr. Moss, and I've added this new bit, all of this stuff is new now, which is including the teeth. Now what happens? Let's look at the spatial matrix. What happens, there are environmentally induced changes in the early morphologic relationship. And these changes produce a new solution, a new outcome. You just change the phenotype. So genetically, or uh, genetically, you're going to have a class one occlusion. And then you went in and you start thumb sucking, or bottle feeding, or pacifier use. Okay, and now you've got a class two occlusion with an increased overjet. You just change the phenotype. You went from a class one to a class two phenotype. Now you've got phenotypic variation. It's a new solution. The body says, I'll give you a system that works in a class two setup as opposed to a class one setup, okay? This uh, new solution, it represents the departure from the genetically encoded body plan. The body's saying, you're supposed to be a class three phenotype or a class one phenotype, but you produced a class two in real life. Now I've got to compensate for that discrepancy, okay? So I'm driving from the airport to the hotel and using my GPS, <coughs> and it says, turn right, and I turn left. And it says, recalculate. That's the compensation the body does. The body's expecting you to be class one, 
but you turned right, you went into a different direction, and now you have to recalculate the compensation is malocclusion, TMD, sleep apnea, etc., etc. These are the developmental compensations that you see. Okay? So what we have here is development compensation occurs to permit compromised function. So I can eat, but my teeth are crooked. I can chew, but I get jaw pain. I can breathe, but I'm snoring at night. Compromised function. It's not ideal. It works, but there's a price to pay with it as time goes on. So what we're going to do, this is developmental compensation. What we're going to do is decompensate through treatment. So what we're going to do is we're going to do appropriate spatial signaling. If the mandible is retruded, I'm going to bring it forwards. If the center of, if it's offline, if it's off center, I'm bring it back to the midline. If it's overclosed, I'm going to increase vertical. If the maxilla is too narrow, I'm going to broaden it. This is spatial signaling, because the body expecting a perfectly symmetrical outcome for this modern human. Long story short. No one is perfectly symmetrical, and we can go into a, a large discussion about symmetry. What we see is fluctuating asymmetry. That's the modern, that's the typical condition. What that means is um, random departure from symmetry. Okay? Take a fiddler crab, you've got directional asymmetry. It's got one really big claw and one small claw. Humans don't have that. We're supposed to be symmetric. Look at athletes. The guy who wins the race is who has the most symmetrical form. Okay? or the swimmer who wins that swimming contest, she has the most symmetrical motion in the water, okay? So what we're going to do is spatial signaling to reestablish the genomic pattern for the best form and the best function. And uh, very good. Now, this was written a few years ago, like 2009, and this paper just came out this year, okay? It's a really good paper to read. It talks about basic cranial growth, that's a cranial base growth. And it's saying that it can modulate the facial shape through epigenetics. What this paper is saying is, I'm going to change the morphology of the cranial base genetically. And by doing so, I'm going to give you a different face shape, even though you have a, quote, normal face. And then the interesting thing is, mind the gap. What does it mean? Which gap is he talking about? Well, here's the gap. In my generation, what we were taught is the genomic thesis. That's what we were taught, is that genes are determine the outcome. You're going to have this type of uh, you know, muscle function, this type of bone structure, this type of skin color, so on and so forth. Okay? That was the genomic thesis. Then there's the alternative idea, which is the epigenetic antithesis. No, 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 the genes are not in control. There's an environmental interaction. That's what produces the outcome. And what we see here is the resolving synthesis. It's a bit of both. Okay, the genes are able to react to and respond to the environment through epigenetic signaling. This is a fascinating paper to read if you get a chance. So how did these concepts arise? So originally I was doing research on babies and children born with craniofacial anomalies like cleft lip and cleft palate. What we see here is a 3D uh, uh, rendering um, of the average 3D face of 10 regular babies. It looks like one child, but actually it's a composite of 10 babies as the average face, okay? And what we're gonna see here is 15 babies with a unilateral cleft lip and palate that were treated non-surgically. So these are the biomodels. Let's look at the biomodels. Here's the biomodels underneath. So here's the topography and the models. We're gonna superimpose them. The green is the kids with the cleft lip and palate who are treated, and the yellow is the control. They are virtually identical. And we do PCA, principal components analysis. This is statistical shape space. Take those models and throw them into a space and see where they land. It's a statistical space, and you can see here's my green and red circles. They're overlapping, and what the statistics is saying is this is one group of patients. What it's telling us is the babies with cleft lip and palate look like regular babies. So you take this little child here, and this movie might not work because it was, uh, let's see, it might not work. Oh, maybe we're lucky. Okay, there you go. So 
this is the same child, and she's been treated non-surgically. Okay? Now, would you guess that she was born in this condition? Okay? So, what? these are wonderful clinicians that I was working with. Uh, Miguel is a plastic surgeon. Uh, Pedro is the orthodontist. So, what did we do here? We harnessed that baby's genetic potential. So, when we see this baby, our lips are drawn to the, to our eyes are drawn to deformity. We see the cleft lip and we see the cleft palate, but that's not what the body is seeing. What the body is seeing is there's a functional, the functional space has been disturbed. This baby can't breathe through the left side of her nose. So what we're going to do non-surgically is open up the nose, use a nasal stent and non-surgically open the nose. This baby can breathe through the nose and can feed through the mouth. When you do that, that lip starts to come together. Okay? We put a plate inside the patient's mouth and non-surgically take the two palate components and mold them together. And there's a millimeter of space left. We ask our plastic surgeon to close the lip and close the palate surgically and then allow the baby to grow. So this is where the ideas came from in that you have a huge degree putting the bits components close to where they're supposed to be, allowing the body to take over its developmental process. This is a teenager. By the time we've seen him, he's already had surgery done on his mid-face, and you can see that he had cleft open palate, and so his mid-face is deficient. He had two or three surgeries done when he was younger. Now we have no choice. We have to do distraction osteogenesis to bring that mid-face forward. So we do this on a group of children, and you can see how concave the same patient is before treatment, and you can see the facial profile improves on the MRI scan. But the crazy thing is that the surgery was done back here. Whoops. The surgery was done right about, it was done there. So my question now is, why did the front part of the maxilla change we didn't touch it. What made that maxilla change? And the answer is, surgically, it was brought forwards into a new spatial relationship. The body is able to remodel that bone according to the blueprint that we have uh, inherited. So that's interesting. We did that for a group of kids. And what we find is teenagers, when they come back, when they come back to the clinic, every single one has a big smile on their face. Every single one. We know they look better. We know they've got more self-esteem. They've got more confidence, okay? But I'm wondering what's given the happy feeling. So I went back and reviewed the MRIs, did an analysis. Red means it got bigger. So the facial profile obviously improved. The bone volume obviously got bigger because of the distraction osteogenesis. But what's that red area there? That's the upper airway. So I'm thinking, wow, these children are sleeping better and when they wake up, they're feeling better, and that gives them the FGF, the feel-good factor. So the question now is, can I achieve this result on the airway? Can I achieve the same result here, non-surgically? And take the word non-surgical and put a different word in there. Can I achieve the similar results epigenetically? Can I do it epigenetically? And if you can, that may be a non-surgical solution for sleep apnea and other airway conditions. That's where the ideas came from. Spatial matrix, I'm going to skip on that unless you have any questions. So we, here's the science which predicts that it should be possible, okay? And so what, before we do that, here's the science, before we do anything, let's find out what we're talking about. Malocclusion here, okay, what is a malocclusion? It's a solution for a complex adaptive system to remain in homeostasis or in equilibrium. This system here is balanced. It works. It doesn't work very well, but it works. Okay. This is a complex system. Complexity. It's got structural complexity. It's got statistical complexity. It's got hard tissue, which is bone, soft tissues, muscle, dental tissue, teeth, and functional spaces. And the interesting thing about this system is it's adaptive. It's not static, it's dynamic. It can remodel, it can respond to the environment. 
What we see here, we call it a malocclusion. What it actually is, is developmental compensation. This is the best result I can give you based on the conditions that I found myself in. So we know what uh, malocclusion is, and what is the occlusion, as I mentioned, the bite? The bite is uh, it's the end point of the body with respect to the plantar surface of the feet, up with these two boundaries, all the functional spaces for physical processes must be accommodated. The whole human body is a system of functional spaces. And as I mentioned, you start life as a flat embryo, and it undergoes curvature, and that's how you get those two boundaries. So, we're going to have postural compensation. So, developmental compensation from the head down, postural compensation is from the feet up, and they're going to be meeting at C1 approximately. So, we've got the ideas, we've got the science. Let's just have an idea in terms of what you're going to do with these patients. So, let's find out the dental arch morphology in patients diagnosed with sleep apnea. Are they different from regular patients? And the answer is yes. And specifically, we look at their upper arch, and patients with OSA, they're between 7 to 11 percent narrower. They're, they have a narrow arch, okay? And they have a smaller, lower arch also. Developmental compensation. So if the maxillary is small, the mandible has no choice but also to be retrognathic based on cranial-based phenotype. It's top-down. So when you have developmental compensation, it goes from the top down, first you've got the cranial base, then you've got the mid-face, then you've got the mandible, then you've got the cervical region. So it's no surprise that patients with OSA have a smaller upper jaw. It's not a surprise. We already know that people like to bring the mandible forwards, but that's only half the story. So we suspected they would have a smaller jaw, but now what this is showing is this finite element analysis is showing the, the, the direction in which the narrowness occurred. So people, people talk about palatal expansion, like a transverse expansion. Before we do that, let's find out, is that the way that these patients with sleep apnea actually present? So what this shows you is the pseudo color scale, the circular one here, it shows you the direction of the change. So it's violet, it's AP, anterior, posterior, sagittal. If it's blue, it's 45 degrees this way. If it's red, it's 45 degrees this way. That area there is kind of violet, which means sagittal AP, the jaw, is foreshortened. Red and blue. What did that patient's jaw do on average in the patients who have sleep apnea? There's 108 of them. On average, what happened is the upper jaw was concentrically collapsed. It's not transverse is concentrically collapsed. And that is telling you what we need to do in terms of clinical compensation. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to do AP development and transverse development, but it's still 2D. You've got to think about the 3D arrangement. Okay? So this is where the protocols came from by looking at data saying this is what happened in the patient with the condition. Here's how we're going to reverse it, correct it, and give them an improvement. So what we're going to do is developmental compensation from the top down, cranial base, mid-face, and then the mandible. And the postural compensation, see the mandible has been retruded, it's a change in posture because of the developmental compensation that occurred in the mid-face. Okay. Does it really happen in real life? So here's uh, an example here. And you can see this is epigenetic orthopedics and orthodontics. The jaw seems to have gotten wider, but there's no spaces between the teeth. How did you do that? Well, the teeth have evolved over millennia. And tooth morphology is designed to have tooth contacts, contact points. The teeth want to be in contact. If the bone biology, if the bone structure, if the bone architecture is physiologic, then the teeth are going to stay in contact. If you do rapid palatal expansion, the teeth are going to go for a walk. You're going to start getting spaces, diastema, tilting. The body doesn't work like that. The way the body works is I grow the bone, then I move the teeth, I grow the bone, then I move the teeth. We're going to mimic that procedure in adult patients subject to a viable population of stem cells. And I've got you know, about 16 to choose from here, 16 populations. This is a patient that came to the office with this condition, what was her chief complaint? 
I've just been diagnosed with sleep apnea. She doesn't care about the teeth, not really concerned with the teeth. She had orthodontic treatment as a youngster. The teeth were straight at some point. But now at age of 45, you can see that this is relapse. Why does relapse occur? Because the body was left in a state, not in homeostasis. It was not in balance. Okay? And the body regressed all the way down, back into homeostasis. But now there's a price to pay for that, and that's called sleep apnea. So what we're going to do, recapture the space. I want the functional space. The space here is bone volume. I want to increase the bone volume. And so at some point, we will put an implant in there and get that back to a more physiologic structure for the maxilla. And when you do that, what happens? When you start working with the bone volume here, you start moving those teeth with the bone, what happens? You start to impact the upper airway. Okay? And uh, you can see this example here. This is a published uh, paper with uh, Dr. Liao, who's here. And what we can see is that the, the upper airway volume has dramatically increased threefold. From 120 to 276, the surface area has increased. Okay? This is an adult patient. And there's no appliance in the patient's mouth when that second study is done. There's nothing in that patient's mouth. That patient has redeveloped their airway. If you did it once, you got lucky. You did it twice, it's a coincidence. You do it three times, there's something going on. We've done it more than three times. So this is the pneumopedic effect. You remodel the airway by targeting the airway, by working with the teeth, talking to the bone, and getting the airway to remodel. This is a published case, 2011. Here's a 38-year-old adult male diagnosed with sleep apnea. Premolars are missing. We want the functional space. We want the bone volume. And in this case, we didn't want to do implants at the end. And so you can see that the teeth here are starting to space because specifically allow the six anterior teeth to, to take up that new bone volume. Okay? And so the intermolar width has increased from 34 to 39. Okay? You can see the airway seems to have improved. You can actually measure it. 58% increase in upper airway volume from 12 to 22 cc's. No surgery, no drugs, no injection, and no pain. This is the, the same guy. Can I wonder if this will work? So we reconstruct everything in 3D so we can see what is the site and the severity of the airway obstruction. And so here's a 3D combi. This is a different patient. Here's a pre-treatment uh, 3D airway, and this is the post-treatment 3D airway. And we, we do a 3D printer. We had a 3D printer. We actually print the physical model for you and show you uh, what it looks like. So here's the same case here. After 15 months, the airway is measurably bigger. You can see the site of obstruction, and now the airway's got bigger, it's wider. The question is, what happened to the sleeve apnea for this patient? Okay. The apnea hypopnea index went from 24 down to 2.8, and that took 10 months. AHI, apnea, hypopnea index, apnea when you stop breathing for 10 seconds, hypopnea when you get desaturation of the blood oxygen level. That happened 24 times every hour whilst this patient is sleeping. Now, he's sleeping now with nothing in his mouth, okay? And his apnea's gone to 2.8. With less than five, it means you no longer have sleep apnea. So this patient's sleep apnea has potentially been cured. Now, let's take a patient who is obese and wants to lose weight, wants to get in shape. They go on a program, they lose weight, they get into shape. What do they do? They stay on a maintenance program so the weight doesn't come back. The fact that this guy has an apnea less than five, no longer has sleep apnea, we want to have him on a maintenance program, make sure it doesn't come back. So maybe he'll sleep with the appliance three, maybe four nights a week passively with no activation, just to make sure the whole thing doesn't uh, come back. But you know, when you wear a device in that way, it acts as an anti-aging device. It supports the facial structure, gives you good cheekbones, gives you a good airway morphology. So here's a paper, 2013, 
the available published studies show evidence, can't be evidence, um, of measured anatomic airway changes with surgery and dental appliances for sleep apnea. The dental appliance they're referring to is the case I just showed you, okay? It was the first case in the literature to show that we can actually potentially cure sleep apnea. Same case, uh, he had a restorative finish at the end and he looks just fine. His, his head posture has improved slightly after about a year or so. So we have enhanced the level of his craniofacial homeostasis. Um, I'm still getting time here. Okay, so uh, what we have here is relapse. A system that's not in homeostasis is going to regress. You just get back into balance. Okay. The interesting thing is that developmental mechanisms that permit relapse in the absence of homeostasis also permit clinical erections. The mechanism that allows the teeth to move without putting braces we call it relapse, the same mechanism can allow the teeth to move in the opposite direction if you can guide the growth and the development. It's the same mechanism working in a different direction. The form of the, uh, the jaws is inherited through genes. The functional, the environmental factors are going to influence the form, so it's an epigenetic phenomenon. The genes are going to interact with the environment, and so what you have is gene-environment interactions. As a whole big bunch of those interactions, and it'll take a generation of people to define them. It's an ongoing endeavor. So here's a, an example of a case study um, to look at the kind of uh, cosmetic changes with health benefits. So this case, um, she's presented and she's been told she's a surgical case. So no option but to treat you surgically, and she prefers not to have surgery. And her thing is that the big gummy smile here and anterior open bite. So what's the first question we ask? The question is why? Why does she have a gummy smile? Why does she have an anterior open bite? Okay. And it's the biomimetics. So the body's going to tell you here's the reason why. The body's going to tell you here's the reason why. And the reason why we can see on her face. Okay. Look at her face here. You see the left nostril? is obstructed. She can't breathe through the left side of her nose. Now, there's the nasal cycle. The nasal cycle means you breathe through one side of the nose for about 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, okay? And then what you do, you cycle to the other side, and you start to breathe through the left side of your nose, okay? Some people show a really well-developed nasal cycle, some people don't, but it's there. So this patient here, She's breathing through the right side of her nose during the day, and everything is fine, and now it's time to switch to the left, but it's obstructed. What does she do? She opens her mouth and starts to mouth breathe, and now there's a change in spatial relations, and so the jaws are going to grow into that space. But what you find with the, tongue, uh, with the mouth open, the tongue comes forwards and perpetuates the anterior open bite. So what we're going to do with this young lady is we're going to redevelop her mid-face, and can you see how her nose has changed here? This is midway through treatment. Now she has the ability to breathe through her nose, which means she can keep her lips together. I'm going to train her tongue to sit in the palate. And then by the end of treatment, her anterior open bite has been resolved. Okay? So you do no surgery, no injections, and no drugs. It took about 18 months. Okay? You can do some final finishing at the end, make it look really nice with uh, braces or, or clear aligners or buildups or whatever, but most of that healing correction will be done using the genetic potential of that human. These are adult patients, okay? This young lady here has been coming to the dentist regularly. She comes for a hygiene appointment and saying, hey doc, I just noticed some lines on the side of my face. Do I need Botox? Okay. Uh, well, let's put this little appliance, just sleep with this appliance and see how you feel. And she's wearing it for about 12 months, okay? She's having dinner with a local plastic surgeon, and he says, wow, that Botox came out really good. And she says, no, I didn't have Botox. What is your secret, okay? The secret is that she remodeled her upper arch. The teeth are slightly better placed, okay? The lower arch, you see, this is without braces. Can you see this asymmetry here? Look at the tongue. The tongue's been pushed back. And when the jaw is remodeled, 
the tongue comes forwards, okay, it's more symmetric. The, the gray is pre-treatment, the blue is post-treatment. Most of the blue is the new bone that she made. It's on, most on her right side. And the mandible has moved into that new space. Now, why was the change asymmetric? Well, look at her face. She's obstructed on the right side of her face. Look at her nose here. Look at her nose here. So the body will target the area of correction if she can guide it into place. Look at her airway. That's why she's feeling better. She went from 17 to 20. She's sleeping better, better uh, blood flow, perfusion, better facial uh, complex, skin complexion improves. Okay, because she's sleeping better, good oxygenation. This is a pneumopedic effect. Remodeling that airway by working with the teeth, working with the bone, working with the functional spaces. Remember that uh, case I showed you? Let's do a study on here to find out does the bone width, the bone width actually increase in adult patients? The average value went from 33 to about 35 and a half, statistically significant. Watch the bone volume here. These are adult patients. Look at the bone. Look at the bone here. This has increased from 14 to 15 cc's. And if we do the study, we find on average it went from 17 to 19 cc's, statistically significant. We actually got a small price for this, showing that you can grow bone in adult patients without using surgery, injections, drugs as a pain-free procedure. It takes about 18 months, but you can do it. Does this patient need mandible advancement? If he was diagnosed with sleep apnea, I don't think so, okay? He's in his mid-twenties. He's been told he's a surgical case, and generally speaking, this will be a surgical case, except he doesn't want to have surgery. Now, he's got sutures in his mid-face. Can we target those sutures? Look at his teeth, anterior and posterior crossbite on both sides. It's being improved to the extent where two years later, that's his facial profile. With no surgery, he's looking fine. So we can change the bone volume of the mid face. What happens to the nasal cavity? Does it get wider? Do you change the cavity, the nasal cavity volume, the nasal airway, do you change that? So here's a study here. There's a one-year-old, uh, for one year, you can see the amount of progress. She's obstructed on her left side, 0.1 millimeters. And you can see after about a year, it's gone to about 1.3. And you might say, well, she was going to grow that way anyway, because it's a child. So let's have a look at an adult case. This is a different case, a young girl, it's a different case. 12-year-old girl here, chronic rhinitis, sleep disorder breathing, not doing well in school. She's a mouth breather, okay? Look at her facial appearance. What do we call that clinically? Adenoid facies. That long kind of face, kind of droopy eyes. You see the thin upper lip. Here she is after about two years. See her facial profile? Same girl. She's doing great in school. Look at her head posture. Okay. How do we know it's adenoid facies? Well, there you are. Okay. Does she need surgery? Possibly. Let's try to see if we can heal that using the body's own capabilities. Now, a patient with a mouth breather, you start getting adenoidal hypertrophy. And if you can convert them to being a nasal breather, they're going to produce nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide is going to pass down here and help with that regression. How do we know that? Same patient, adenoids have regressed. You can see her nasal obstruction here a little bit. And you can see post-treatment is going to clear it up. And uh, you see her teeth have improved. The uh, anterior crossbite has been corrected. Okay, she's breathing better, sleeping better. She is no longer, she's uh, nasal breathing. She's doing great in school. And her rhinitis has been totally resolved. Those were pediatric cases. Here's an adult case here. You can see that before treatment, about a millimeter. Here's the nasal septum. Here's inferior conchi, the distance here is 1.2 millimeters. And after treatment, here's the nasal septum, that distance there is about three millimeters. So are we able to actually redevelop the nasal airway by having an appliance in the patient's mouth? Well, let's do the study. 
The aim of the study is to look at the nasal cavity volume, and they're going to have this biomedic oral appliance. We took 3D calm beams, average age is 38, took about 18 months of treatment. All these patients have clinically a smaller than optimal mid face. And we're going to acquire the nasal cavity volume, do a 3D reconstruction. Here's the details of how we did it. We're going to remove the sinuses. We're going to measure the nose volume. Okay, so here's the 3D comb beam. I just want to measure the nasal cavity volume here. I can remove all that information. Do the 3D reconstruction. Here's the sinuses on both sides. There's a the nasal cavity. Remove the sinuses. Here's the nasal cavity here. Measure the volume. I'm going to measure the volume of this guy here and then do the statistical test to see did anything happen pre and post treatment. Look at the outside of the face. Look at the nares, broad, and this is obstructed. The, the ala cartilage is slightly collapsed on that patient. Here he is post-treatment, nice open nares. He doesn't need the, the nasal strips, okay? And we look at the actual findings. The average was 39.8 went to 42.3, statistically significant. This paper's coming out in January of next year. Actually, we got a small price for that last year to show that we can increase the nasal cavity volume in adult patients with no surgery. Here's a patient who was part of that cohort. So this is the patient actually had that treatment done. This is Tamari Hai, she's in Canada. And the example of a patient who had the non-surgical procedure, what is the diagnosis here? Deficient craniofacial homeostasis, we see nasal obstruction, we see malocclusion, and we see sleep apnea. She is 18 months later, okay? She's been resolved. She's a happier, healthier patient. So, we are able to increase the nasal cavity volume. Is there an impact, is there any knock-on effect on patients of sleep apnea, okay? So here's a study to say, can we enhance the upper airway so that a lifetime of CPAP might, not be, might be avoidable? So these patients are stuck on CPAP for the rest of their life. If CPAP was a biomimetic, we'd have the genes to make one. We don't, okay? So we want to get them off CPAP. We want them to sleep physiologically, okay? So here's a patient greater than 21 years old. The home sleep test was interpreted by a board-certified sleep physician. All of them were treated by a dentist, Tara Griffin, with uh, advanced training in dental sleep medicine. The apnea hypopnea index was calculated, no appliance to the patient's mouth. So when you do the sleep study before and after treatment, there is nothing in this patient's mouth. Here's the findings. On average, it went from 13 down to about 4. It took about 8 months. 68% decrease in apnea hypopnea index, and so if it's less than five, if it's less than five, if it's less than five, it means that they no longer have sleep apnea, okay? This, the study was actually published uh, earlier on, I think uh, this year, or was it last year? It was last year, 2014, published last year, and what it shows is um, these patients no longer have sleep apnea with nothing in the mouth. Their sleep apnea has been resolved. Um, those were mild and moderate cases. So you look at these published studies, it's mild and moderate cases. So what happens if you have uh, someone with severe sleep apnea, and now these patients are AHI of 105. So 5 to 15 would be mild, 15 to 30 would be moderate, and above 30 would be severe, and this young lady is at 105. That's, that's a big number. Okay. She does a sleep study in the hospital. It's at 118. That's a pretty severe index. She referred to the ENT surgeon. He does a tonsillectomy, and it's going to be controlled with CPAP for the rest of her life. She's 27, and she didn't like that idea. So now her um, HI is about 60. Still got severe sleep apnea even after the surgery. Okay. And what we're going to do is put on a DNA appliance, okay, for about 10 months, about 9 months, with the CPAP in place, okay, and we're going to test her HI without anything in the mouth, and it comes back at 1 per hour, less than 5. 
So within the period of nine months, her sleep apnea has been cured. Okay. Here's the board certified uh, sleep physician. What's his report saying? No obstructive sleep failure with or without the appliance. Here's a patient with severe sleep apnea who is now sleeping physiologically and she's done, she's fine. That's what she looks like pre and post treatment. This is her airway before treatment. You see her tongue is here. This is her soft palate here, I think. Okay, look at the obstruction here. And her airway has been remodeled. Now she's got some, something to breathe with. Now she's got the architecture she needs to breathe. So you're a re able to remodel the airway indirectly by allowing the teeth to talk to the bone, which talk to the airway. And if you do so, you get improved facial appearance. So what's our conclusion is that upper airway changes can be obtained in non-growing adults, which suggests there's a genetically encoded developmental mechanism working. And this mechanism can be modulated epigenetically using biomedical appliances, which enhance the upper airway. And these findings are going to help biological dentists and orthodontists to manage patients, adult patients with sleep apnea, using a pneumopedic effect. Remember the first slide? Which one is it? Okay. It, we tried to take a simple idea of pneumatization. Okay. And so, which of these is uh, your deciding statement? So we have training seminars. Next one's going to be in our office in December in Beaverton. as uh, online certification also. And uh, this is at the World Association of Sleep Medicine. This is Dr. Gimeno. These are the guys from the Mayo Clinic. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> yes, there is time for questions. I finished 20 minutes early. Yes. Thanks for the great talk. I've heard You're you welcome. before. Uh, I've always said to be a, a decent dentist, you have to know orthopedic orthodontics, or else you're just basically a dentist. <laughs> now, what's the difference between your appliances uh, now and what we did in the 70s? Almost it was illegal those days, functional orthodontics, orthopedics, fixed appliances, which did quite similar uh, results. Excellent. So Excellent. what's the difference? Excellent question. What is the difference? And so what we have here is his history, fixed appliances, removal appliances, functional appliances. It doesn't tell us anything. All it tells you is the removal appliance goes in and out, fixed appliance it doesn't, and functional appliances I don't know. So what we have here is biomimetic appliances. Specifically, what these appliances are going to do is they're going to replicate or try to follow the way the body naturally grows and develops. So you say, well, you know what? I was doing orthopedics before. That's great, but where are you targeting the airway? Orthopedics is bone remodeling. I was doing orthodontics before. Great, that's teeth. Where are you targeting the soft tissues? So you want craniofacial correction. You want hard tissue, which is bone. That's orthopedics. Dental tissue, that's teeth, that is orthodontics. But we also want the pneumopedics, which is addressing the airway, and number four, the soft tissues. Now, of those soft tissues, which was your first soft tissue that you're going to correct? Because after you did fixed orthodontics, after you did your removal appliances, after you did your functional appliances, you're going to need a retainer. Well, if you needed a retainer, you'd be born with one, okay? So actually, we are born with a retainer. It's pink, and it's called the tongue. Totally so what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the craniofacial architecture can deliver the function that we, win, that we want and that we can maintain it as the patient goes older. So we need the airway correction, the bone correction, the tooth correction, and the soft tissues. That's a difference. Long story real short. I can go on a little bit more, but that's a long story real short. 
See, in my practice, uh, I'm a more of a pain practitioner and I have a medical office too. Mm. What we see in our 3D x-rays with adults with a lot of problems mm. is the biological question of the fungal issues and the sinuses, correct. which is almost very difficult to correct. correct. Unless, so on those really difficult cases with the microbial issues and fungal issues, then you have another field to tackle with the orthopedic orthodontic issues. Correct. So when you talk about fungal and microbial issues, what's happening is that we are set up for specific structure. Specifically, the nose is for breathing, but guess what? It's for smelling. Now, if you want to smell some tissue, uh, some, some, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, fragrance or perfume or whatever, you know, there's a specific type of airflow that you need. You need turbulent airflow. They're called turbinates. They stir up the air. If you've got laminar flow, you're going to get stagnation of air. You're going to get sinusitis, okay? We know that over a long period of time, you get nasal collapse, okay? So it's not just about the structure, it's about the function. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to replicate the physiologic architecture for the best form and the best function. So the subtle difference is, but we convert mouth breathers into nasal breathers, and suddenly, wow, that food smells really nice because of the way the air is flowing. And they're breathing better because now they're picking up the nitric oxide because if there's no stagnation or contamination of the sinuses, the sinus health improves, and now you've got better oxygenation. So it's two sides of the same coin. We have to go, uh, we have to go beyond orthopedics. But orthopedics is great. We have to go beyond orthopedics and saying, I need to target this air, airway and the airway behavior. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I had a couple of people come up to me. What you gave me was the PDF of this, and it printed horribly. So I apologize for what you're looking at in your book. And on the jump drive, it looks exactly the same as what's in the book. So those of you that are coming back to me asking for a jump drive, because what's in the book is completely illegible. It's just a bunch of black squares. Is there a way they can get the PowerPoint presentation so that they can see what they just saw? Someone's going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on it. Absolutely. Okay. We'll work on so it. If, if we could get something that's more legible and then we can email it to yes. those of you. That, um, I've got that question several times in the last hour and a half, but no thank worries. you. You're welcome. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, we want to say thank you well, very much. Thank you. And we have a little gift for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.